Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham, a.k.a. Midnight, and this is my good pal Ty Frank. They call him Ty One On Frank. Sexy Pants. Sexy Pants. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I, I like Ty One On Frank. You know, in, in high school, I, I, there was a bunch of kids that called me Ty Stick. Uh -huh. Like, I tell people that, and they assume it meant I was a stoner in high school, but uh -huh. I, like ne I never drank in high school. I never smoked pot. I didn't do any fun stuff in high school. I was like... Was it a naughty nickname? A total straight-laced like, kid. Uh, the stick? Tie stick? Tie yeah. stick is, is, a, is a kind of, it's, it's like a joint. Oh, oh, boring. Yeah. Like tie bud, tie stick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, well, that's good. Uh, what episode are we talking about today? 203, I think. Uh, static. And this one is, uh, as I recall, written by Robin Vyth. Your friend in mine, Robin Vyth. Our friend, Robin Vyth. Um, friend and, of the show. Uh, friend of the show. And uh, Jeff Olno, who uh, this is his uh, first of two episodes this season. Because he does two every season. It's uh, required by Canadian law. Our longest running director, uh, Jeff Wellnow. Yeah. Uh, so we'll start off with Bobby and the Martians. Uh, their moon, Deimos, has just been blown out of the sky. And they're, they want Earth or blood. They're riled up. They're ready, they're ready to do some battle. There's a little scuffle. They get in a scuffle. Bobby gets sent up to the, to the lieutenant. Uh, lieutenant Sutter uh, explains to her that they're not going to war at that moment. And, uh, and that they are, they're going to Ganymede to protect their food supply. What, what I think is interesting about what's, it, it's almost like Bobby and Bobby wants the same thing that Aaron Wright wants, right? They want war. It's kind of like the id of their planet, you know, the, the aggressive, we want vengeance, we want it now. And it's always, it's counterbalanced, it's counterbalanced with Avasarala on Earth and with, you know, the, the level headed, the more level-headed, older Martian Marines. My question to you is, is has Martian, or has uh, Bobby been in war yet? Has she been in battle? Like, real battle? With real stakes? Yeah. She, well, no, I mean, she's done, um, she's done police actions in the belt. So she's been in combat, but it's been small-scale stuff. It's, it hasn't been, you know, obviously Mars and Earth have never gone to war with each other. Okay, so, but has she seen uh, casualties? Have she seen... The, yeah, the horror. Yeah, she's horror? done. Yeah, she's done. She's done police actions in the belt. I mean, she's uh, if you if you picture like, you know, like us soldiers that are doing uh, stuff in like Afghanistan or Iraq now. Right. That's kind of what she has seen. So right. you're going to occasionally see an IED. You're going to occasionally see a sniper take some shots at your buddies. Mm -hmm. And every now and then you'll get like there'll be a mortar attack, but you're not, you know, you're not in like full scale World War Two scale battles. So she's been in some some dust ups, but she hasn't really. She's been, been in, in some full scale war. She's been in some scrapes. No, no, so nobody's nobody's been in a nobody's been in yeah. a full scale war. Yeah, yeah. What I think is interesting is that you know what I said earlier, playing a role. You know, Avisarala Avis in the in the situation on Earth, she's the one that's kind of measuring everything and tempering everything down to figure out what's going to trying to lower the tension and. But but that's not you know it, it's it's it, what's what's uh, what I love about the experience is it's never one way or the other. There's never this one villain. Aaron Wright is not necessarily a, a villain. You know he, he's not he's somebody that is self interested uh, and trying to do what he thinks is best for Earth, mostly for himself, uh, Earth by proxy. And then you 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 look at Mars and you see the the you you see the dichotomy of the people that are ready to go to war. And they're going, going, they're so convinced and they, they believe they're going to win because they have to. And that's the way they train. When you train, you need to train that confidence into them that they're going to fucking win. They got to go in believing that they're going to win. But the higher ups who've been around, who've seen a little bit of war, also that knows the capability of the Earth's Navy, the size and scope, even though it's a little bit slower, it's not as uh, technologically advanced as Mars, uh, it's, it's going to be a battle, you know? And. Aaron Wright realizes, like, this might be the last chance we can beat Mars. So this might be the time yeah. to go to war with them, which, is, uh, which makes sense, but it's scary that it makes sense, you know? Well, and that is, that is why he's, so, uh, he's such a hawk. He's so pro-war right now because he's, he's seen the numbers. He knows that in 50 years, Earth's not going to have the advantage anymore. Right now, it's got a narrow advantage. That advantage is going to disappear over the next 50, 100 years. And once that advantage has disappeared, you know, he, he, like he tells his boss, he's like, That's, at that point, we might as well be their colony. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
that lo- that loss of status. I mean, you know this. Uh, you and I have conversations about status and buying status and and all the the status trap. Mm-hmm. We're both people who are very like resistant to the whole idea of, of like buying your way into status. The thing you have to know about status is anybody who has had status, especially if they've had it for a long time, the prospect of losing it is terrifying. Mm-hmm. And you've got, you know, Aaron Rice going, Earth was always the most important planet in the solar system. There is a possibility we might lose that. That is a horrifying prospect. That cannot be allowed to happen. And he's willing to go to war for that. You know, that, that is really interesting. I, I, was, I came across this thing on YouTube, and it's called America in Color. And you can watch each decade. I can't, I, I can't remember what channel it's from, but it, I just found it on YouTube. And they go through each decade, and, they, and it's a little s- summary of those 10 years in American history, but it's all in color. They colorize all the footage, and it's, it's really fascinating yeah. to watch because it's, it's remastered, and that footage looks so clear that you're literally watching what looks like something that was filmed a week ago, but it was in the 30s. And, uh, and I was watching, the one I was watching just happened to be the 30s, and it was during the Great Depression, and it was right after the massive stock market crash. And there were people that lost, you know, their fortunes, that lost everything they ever had, that they owned. They lost all their wealth and their money, and they were killing themselves. And, you know, these yeah. mass, and you think, where are you mentally that if you lost your money, if you lost your status, that you feel like you were nothing and that you would have to kill yourself. And a lot of these yeah. guys in like 10 or 15 years, they rebounded. And so the, yep. the guy that, you know, and so it, it's just a, it's a really uh, tricky thing when you get caught up in that because I want to know, I'm curious of how many wars were fought over that very reason. You know, how many, how many, yeah. con- how many powerful countries have done the quick math and realize, like, this country over here at some point is going to overtake us. So if we, we, need to, we need to whoop their ass now because if we wait, then we won't be able to. That's a scary yeah. prospect. So can we talk a little bit now? What's up, what's up with the Martian gym, man? <laughs> it's like, they, you know, these are supposed to be the baddest motherfuckers in the, in the solar system. And, uh, I, you know, I don't know if it's because Breck took too much of the budget on the first two seasons, but you got their gym and it's literally like a weighted ball and a band, you know, Bobby Draper, who's a, who's just a, a sledgehammer. Who's just a powerful, powerful woman is, is like stretching a band out. And, uh, and it, you know, and, and, and there's a bench, there's a weighted ball and there's a band and they're in there working yep. out and that's their gym. What, I hated that set. I hated that set. Yeah. And uh, oh, so no defense. I just you just it didn't make any no, sense. Sometimes yeah. sometimes you got a terrible set, man. Yeah, I mean, there's. I the, mean, not, no, not to not to throw the not to throw the you know that department under the bus. Yeah, um, you know they make a lot more good sets than bad sets. But every now and then, every, you know, everybody, you know, I mean, every every department, including the writing department, which I'm part of, you're going to deliver a turkey. That set yeah. was a turkey, man. <laughs> I mean, can you get a heavy bag or a speed bag or have a shooting range in there or, you know what I'm saying? I, I do think maybe a fun uh, thing on, on, our, on the show is like to try to find one flaw so we're not just kissing each other's ass the whole show. Like we, can, we need to call out at least one flaw, you know, so then the people know we're trying to give an honest uh, interpretation and assessment of, of the thing we just watched. And so that's my flaw. The season is like these badass Mickey Martians, you know, that are in there get gearing for war, smelling blood, and she literally has a band that, uh, uh, and not even a family of bands. Like I, I'm, I'm a big believer in like stability training and all that stuff. But there's one band, <laughs> just one, and then there's, <laughs> and there's one weighted ball. And then I was like looking around, and I was like, well, there's probably you know stuff in the shit. No, it's an empty room with a bench. What was the one, uh, the one Martian Marine's name that's from Texas? He's from Earth, and they give him shit the whole time. Yeah, because he's the one who gets blamed for the thing later. Yeah, um, uh, um, Bo- Bobby blasts him in the jaw. Yeah, what is that? What is that character? Oh, Travis. Travis. Okay, so Travis, Travis is sitting yeah. down in the bench, dabbing himself uh, from dripping sweat, and I'm and I'm like, where the fuck is the sweat coming? There's not even a treadmill in this gym. <laughs> How is he sweating like that? I don't even see a jump rope. Was he doing jumping jacks? I don't know. But yeah, so that that'll be my my uh, my one flaw. And so uh, Frankie 
uh, Bobby Draper, you know, is not happy about the fact that they got to go to Ganymede and protect the food source, which is actually really a really smart move. So now we pick up on the Rossi, and Holden is fired the fuck up at Miller. It's the maddest I've ever seen, Holden. And, uh, you know, I, when they come walk, uh, again, like I'm watching a lot of these from the first time, and I, and, I, and I remember that moment, but we come walking off the, uh, uh, the spaceship, and fucking Holden turns around and sees Miller, and he goes, hey, I don't want him anywhere near. And I was like, whoa, Holden is pissed. And uh, even Naomi's like, hey, kid, chill the fuck out, dude. <laughs> like, you know, you can see that. Now, what is it about that action that's triggered Holden the way that it has? I mean, if you really, you know, if you sit and think about it, uh, you can understand. I mean, you know, poor Miller went from like, hey, leave your stuff in the bunk and, you know, may- maybe, well, you know, you-, you-, you got a place here and everything to like, get that motherfucker. And then Fred shows up and is like, find a ship and get off. And you kind of feel bad for, for old Miller in that situation. Well, it's, it, so here, here's the thing. Think about what they did to catch, capture that station. 25 people sacrificed their lives to capture that station, right? 25 people on that first pod got killed. The Rossi got shot up. Naomi almost got killed. You know, one of those PDC rounds from the, the ship they were fighting went through inches from her head, went yeah. through the ship like inches from her head. So, so Holden almost sacrificed his crew, did sacrifice 25 belters who died on the, one of the drop pods, and all of it was to get answers about what's going on. Right. They fight their way through the station. They capture the guy who can give them answers. And before they're able to get any information out of him, and, and even, though, in, even though we understand why Miller did what he did, and we mm-hmm. both do, I understand why he did what he did, the thing that he did is incredibly selfish. He's got a need for revenge. He's got a need to weigh the scales for Julie's death. He pulls the trigger on this guy. That's the only consideration in that moment. It is an incredibly selfish moment for him. Then you've got all these people who just who either died or almost died to get answers out of this guy. Fuck them. They don't they don't get to learn anything, right? I totally get why Holden is pissed. He's going, you know, we almost we all almost got killed to catch this guy, and then just because you have a hard on for Julie, and you want to like get some sort of romantic ideal revenge for her, you just shoot him. Now his thing about you know like I didn't shoot him because. He was crazy. I shot him because he was making sense. Like that, sure, that's an abstraction that happens later. But in the moment, he shot him because this is the guy who killed Jewel. Let's <laughs> yeah, just be because about that. well, I wanted to say at the end when he gives that ex- explanation, I'm like, uh, I think you might have thought this through because <laughs> why didn't you say that yeah. shit in the beginning? Whatever, you know, exactly. you might have thought it through. And like, ah, shit, no, nobody likes me. Maybe I did do a, a shitty thing. But from uh, from Holden's, I mean, that was elo- elo- eloquently put. Thanks, Ty. But. I will say that they have Cortazar, and, and didn't they get all the data from the ship? Yeah, but keep in mind, that data is all locked. That's the last, thing, the last thing Dresden did was lock everything. He locked all the data. You can't and, and get they it. Can't, and they, couldn't, they can't get it from Cortazar? Well, Cortazar knows the pieces that he knows, but Dresden, Dresden was the architect of the entire program. Dresden yeah. was the top guy. He knows everything. Cortazar okay. knows some stuff. So, I mean, yeah, they do eventually get some information from Cortazar, and that is helpful. Right. But in the moment, right. you don't know that. I mean, it could have turned out like Cortazar was in charge of one tiny little piece, and that's the only thing he knows. You don't know yet, right? Yeah. The yeah. guy who knew everything is now dead. And, and yeah. here's the thing is like, if you just want this guy dead, you take him back, you interrogate the shit out of him, you tell him you're going to give him, oh, yeah, we're totally going to let you start your experiments again. Just give us all, unlock the data, give us all the information. And the minute he does that, you throw him out of fucking airlock. Right? No, you have you have you have Benicio del Toro from Sicario come and, and interrogate him <laughs> with, a thing, with a big bucket of water. Um, okay, that that makes sense to me now. I I I I get you, I take your point, Ty. I take your point. Yeah. So now Holden and Amos and Fred Johnson they go and visit Cortazar, and what they need to know uh, the information that you just said they need to get that from Cortazar. Also, they're going to need Cortazar's help if they have any. Uh, hope of making a vaccination. 
So they need to get in and they need to talk to Cortazar and they need to figure out what the proto molecule is up to, what they learn in the experiments, and is there a possibility uh, for creating a vaccine and, and getting him to help them with that. And Holden makes a mistake because Holden tries to appeal to him emotionally. He talks about his mother. He talks about and uh, and also shout out to the actor who played Cortazar. He's very good. Uh, he did a, he did a really great job in that. I'm uh, I'm drawing a blank. I don't remember off the top of my head, but uh, he he's we're actually working with him this season too. He's 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 great. Oh, so you work with him twice and you don't remember his name? God damn, I know. Hollywood. Yeah. You Hollywood? Yeah. You, you, oh. you, you know our, yeah. our call sheet is like 700 <laughs> names long, right? Uh, you know, it took Ty seven years, but he's going to Hollywood. He don't remember anybody's name. Barely remembers my name. Uh, anyway, he's, he's a phenomenal actor. remember your actor. name, Rick. <laughs> he's a phenomenal actor and, and we'll definitely, uh, and I, you know, so, uh, I apologize for right now. I'm, I'm not very bright, so I don't remember things very well. Um, anyway, he does such a great job of not, of, of not taking the bait that Holden, he's just, comp- you know, Holden's talking a completely different language. They're trying to, uh, to bait him in. Oh, here's the name. Yeah, Carlos Gonzalez Vio. Yes. Great job, Carlos. Phenomenal actor. Good guy. Uh, great beard. Great, great beard work. Great beard work on that. So uh, they leave and they, they talk to a doctor, and a doctor explains to them, which you and I talked about uh, last episode. She explains to him the procedure that he had done on his mind to remove the emotional roadblocks to doing the kind of work that he needs to do. And yep. uh, there's a really interesting moment in that, a split second of a moment where Amos asked the doctor if it could be reversible. And it kind of starts to give you a little bit of understanding that this is, is, this, this is particularly resonating with Amos. And so yep. now Amos, Am- but what it really does is it, 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 it allows Amos to really understand how he, can, how he can get the information he needs from Cortazar. And so he sits down and he starts talking to Cortazar, which is a, it's a really kind of a sexual, you know, story that he's telling them about the proto molecule. And in a way, it kind of turns Cortazar on to where he starts talking and it can't stop. So now he figured out how to crack the code and he goes and gives Holden the pedophilia analogy. And, uh, you know, number one, this also, reveals a little bit about Amos's past and about what he's experienced growing up and how that he would even know how to talk to somebody like this. But number two, explain the logic and the reasoning behind what he says to Holden. I mean, I think, I think it's pretty well explained in the scene. What he's saying is, you know, if, you, if you've got somebody who, who lusts for something, whatever that thing is, you don't walk up to them and say, hey, do you lust for this thing? Uh, People are obviously, when they're directly confronted like that, they're going to pull back and go, uh, what are you talking about? I don't But as, as Amos points out, you don't go up and ask them. You show them pictures of the thing. You, you tell stories about the thing. You, you create sort of a we're in this together sort of rapport with the person. And then they'll open up about the thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he, he's... Uh, which is which is right. I mean, um, anytime anytime somebody starts interrogating you, the natural human reaction is to withdraw. Mm-hmm. You know, if if somebody comes up to you and has a conversation with you about something, mm-hmm. and and it's clear that you guys have you know a bit of a a shared interest in that thing, mm-hmm. then you can get people to open up. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just as an example, uh, I'm not ashamed of the fact that I'm a writer, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. but I, I was, I was on a flight once it was a longer flight. It was like five and a half hours mm-hmm. and I'm sitting next to this guy and he, he, you know, every now and you, you, you're on a flight and there's the guy next to you just really wants to talk. Right. And he turns and he goes, and he's like, Hey, so what do you do? And I was like, I was like, Oh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a writer. And then he, this dude just started giving me the third degree about being a writer. And right. I didn't want to tell this guy shit. Like I, uh-huh. I kept pulling back. Like I kept trying to withdraw. Like I didn't want to say anything because well, like, I felt like well, it was what was he saying? Like was he giving you tips? No, no, he was interrogating. Like just ham- question after question after question. Oh. But now 
I've, I've been in a similar situation where I was hanging out with somebody and they're like, Hey, so what do you do? And I'm like, Oh, I'm a writer. And then, and then they'll, they'll they have a conversation with you, which is like, mm-hmm. Oh yeah. You know, a buddy of mine, he, he, he used to, he, he wrote a novel and he was talking about the struggles of publishing. And I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and then, and then now we're having a conversation about it. Yeah. So I think the thing, the thing Amos knows is if he goes, if you go in there and you hammer Cortazar about wanting to kill mm-hmm. people with alien viruses, probably mm-hmm. go to withdraw. If you go right. in there and you say, Hey, is it killing people with alien virus is kind of cool? Look at these awesome pictures of people dying of alien virus. Then he, the, then Cortazar is going to be like, yeah, it is kind of cool. Look, Oh, let me see the pictures. Right. Uh, right. there's just, it's a natural human thing to, to right. withdraw when you feel like right. you're being interrogated. It's like, if you said to me, Wes, are you, uh, are you looking at Daisy and Dukes of Hazard in an, in an unwholesome way? Daisy from Dukes of Hazard. I would say no, Ty. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare do that. But if you do, but if you start describing to me the Daisy Dukes and and how high they ride up. Wow. <laughs> you <might>. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, I, has, I was just trying to give it an analogy. I, I, I was just trying to. Has Wes been free? watching a little Dukes of Hazard lately? <laughs> I, I mean, was just trying to. I was just trying to help you out with the the analogy of the story. So uh, moving on to. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so now Holden knows how to talk to Cortazar, and uh, he goes down, and they use the uh, pedophilia technique. I guess that's what you would call it, and and gets Cortazar talking about the proto molecule. And what they learn is that the proto molecule is building towards something. And uh, do you want to explain the the level of what they know when they before they leave that cell? Meaning how far. Because he explains to them a lot about the proto molecule. So, what exactly do they know when they're leaving that cell? I mean, if I if I remember correctly, what they know is this idea of that there's going to be a cure for it. Probably not. Probably not. And uh, I think the implication there is that it's building something that there because you know Cortazar says it always moves forward. It's you know it's building. It's becoming something. Mm-hmm. Those two ideas are very important. The, you know, yeah. the, the fact that that's wasting time trying to find a cure, not a good plan. Exactly. And if we don't want this thing to finish becoming what it's going to become, we should stop right. it now. It puts yes. it puts a bit of a time pressure on them. Right. Yes. So yeah. they come out of that thinking we got to do something about arrows. We can't just leave it out there because if you don't know that there's no reason to go back to arrows. You could be like, well, it's infected with this horrible thing, but it's an asteroid. Nothing can get off of it. Let's just leave it alone. Right, what Cortazar tells them is you can't just leave it alone, and that's when the uh, the episode really kicked into gear for me because you go from you know can we can we create a vaccine we need to get this info to to learning that this is actually they're actually it's actually building towards something it's a, it has a goal mm-hmm. and we're not going to like it when, it when it hits that goal so now we have an urgency of we got to handle whatever this thing is and we got to handle it right away and Naomi. Uh, who runs into uh, Drummer, and they ended up um, they end up going. They're, they're partying like it's 1939, baby. They go to play uh, handball on the court, uh, which is a really cool sequence. A cool handball handball sequence. They're having fun. She kind of gets back in to her belt belter swing of things. She, they go to a club. Yeah. They're drinking. They're partying, and it's reminding her of the past. You know, and it, what I love about the Expanse is I I like how I like what it says about identity. And if you spent a lot of time like you have as a writer or as an actor, you start to learn over over time that how malleable identity is, how fragile it is. And that essentially, you know, you have a string of memories that you put a narrative on and then you think that's who you are. But that but who you think you are is not you, you, you know, it, that's not really accurate to that. So, for instance, like when I go home and I see my friends, like the friends that I grew up with, and you start, I've, I don't know if you've noticed this, but you start hanging out with them and the kind of old sense of humor comes back, the old, you know, relationship dynamics of friends and, you know, uh, how, you to think, how you used to think about things. It all kind of starts to awaken within you uh, that, that if you've been removed from it for a very long time, you, you completely forget. You know, do you have like when you go back to 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 hang out with your cult buddies? 
<laughs> do you guys? Do you guys ever? Does it ever awaken the religious uh, bug in you? <laughs> like, it does not. I, I, and here's the thing: is be, do, do because you, of do you, the, do, you, do you find yourself doing old sacrifices just for old times' sake, or anything like that, like slaughtering goats, or you know? Look, uh, human sacrifice is fun for the whole family. It doesn't have to be religious. It doesn't. Have, don't you know. don't have to bring all that. All that to it. It can just be fun. <laughs> I don't know if Ty and that guy family, I don't know if, if, the, if the people listening, I don't know if they know that Ty was in a full-fledged cult. Tell, tell us a little bit about your story, Ty. We, I like was to bring misery. A, <laughs> I was not, a, well, I, it, they certainly have cultish behavior. No, I was in a, it was, it was a, a sex very, cult. Uh, God, I wish. <laughs> yeah, no. It was an anti-sex cult. No, it, I, was, I grew up in a very conservative, ultra ultra conservative i would say evangelical millennialist christian group and yeah uh, there's a lot of behaviors there that are cult like but when you say cult it brings up the idea of like you know david koresh and that kind of shit it wasn't anything like yeah. that uh but it was but it, it was a pretty oppressive it was a pretty oppressive environment to grow up in for sure it it was it was more extreme than than you know others Right, I mean, there was it, it was it, an, yeah. it was it was more extreme than growing up Baptist for sure. Okay, and <laughs> was it yeah. the inspiration for the Handmaid's Tale? Your uh, your cult? No, no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Margaret Atwood wrote that book before I was born, I think. <laughs> uh, oh, the only thing I know about that book is the movie they did in the eighties about it. So, um, the TV show they did on Hulu, like now. No, no, that's what I with our with our friend oh. Yvonne, who's on was true. No, 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 I I know that sh- obviously. I'm talking yeah. about the first time I came across The Handmaid's Tale was in the '80s. Uh, the movie that they did in the '80s. Do you remember that movie? I don't. Oh, it no, blew I my mind when I saw it. Yeah. No, it was it was nothing like that. So what I love about the Expanse is the conflict of identities that is always going on. So she goes back and she the Belter life inside of her gets awakened. She's hanging out. She's feeling. Uh, the excitement and the thrill of being a belter and that belonging and that sense of community. And then it, it starts to interfere with her new loyalties, with the Rosinante, with, with you know, managing the relationship between Earth, Mars, and the belt, and the relationship she has with Stephen. And so there's always these conflicting identities. Stephen having this enormous sense of response, oversized sense of responsibility because of his farm and what he grew up in and what, what he thinks he is, what, what is important to him, his identity. Amos is struggling with the fact of like trying to to become a normal, uh, well functioning human being, and uh, you know so that's that's one of the things that I I really like about Expanse. So now we go to poor Miller. <laughs> Nobody likes him. Holden yelled at him. Fred Johnson told him to get the fuck off the ship. They had Amos go. <laughs> they had Amos go clean his shit out, and uh, and cold blooded. They had Amos go. <laughs> clean, they, had, they had Amos clean his shit out, drop it off at the bar, and you know the, probably the least uh, uh, bedside manner of of any of uh, anybody on the show. And and Miller's you know basically like he doesn't want to see me anymore, and he's like, nope, <laughs> he's done with you, man. You know, uh, but I you know he says like I understand what you did. You know, he took your girl and you had that moment. So now Miller's alone. You know, completely and totally alone. Uh, he goes and shares. Uh, I, I do. I do want to say though. You said you said that they send the guy with the least bedside manner when they send Amos, right, to do this. I agree with that, but I but I honestly think I honestly think that's what you want. Like, uh, I if, if I'm Miller, I want the guy who's not going to bring any emotional baggage to it. I want the guy who's just going to show up, tell me without any extra baggage what happened and why I'm being kicked out. Yeah, I would prefer that guy to be the guy to deliver the bad news. Like, if right. I'm going to get bad news in life, I want Amos to be the person who delivers the bad news because he's so, not going to put any emotional shit on it. He's just going to tell yeah. you the way it is, and I prefer that. So, I actually think if I was Miller, I would be happy. Amos is the one who showed up. Okay, so you need to tell your wife that from now on, you want all bad news to go through me. So, if anything bad happens in your life, tell her to share it with me, and I will call and uh, let you know. Uh, here's <laughs> here's the deal? thing, though, like. <laughs> You, it's funny. This is this this should you know, and I I've seen people make this comment online. Um, you can tell that you're a good actor because you are the least Amos person I've ever met. (laughs) (laughs) 
Like in real life, you are the opposite of Amos. This shows you're a good actor, man. But yeah, but, but, but I would then, not want my then, I would not want my bad news delivered by you. But hold on. What part am I playing? Am I playing the part of me in life or am I playing Amos? What if I'm really Amos, but I know that I can't function in the world like that, so I created this character? What if there's two of them in me? Then you would be me. Cuz I will say, I will say uh there was a uh you know, if, if you once you start acting and I'm sure you've had this realization when you start writing, you realize like your first the first thing that you've the first characters that you created, the first time that you've acted is not when you're doing it professionally or not even when you're doing it in class. Yep. It's when you're doing it because you want to fit in. It's when you're doing it uh when um when you're in high school and it's the most kind of separated time where people dress this way and this, that, and everything. You're like, where the fuck do I fit in? You kind of play a role uh, to, to be able to just be accepted, to fit in, especially when social pressures are the worst. And what happens is, is when you, the older you get, the more you let go of all that, all those false roles and you, and, and you just, you let it all go because you're not trying to fit in anymore. Well, I mean, that's an ongoing struggle. I think, I think you've done well with that, but I think uh, some people are, are kind of struggling with that. So anyway, uh, Diogo uh, gives him a place to stay, which uh, I'm going to have to call out another set, man. I mean, it looks like a, a, a dorm room in the 90s. And by the way, I thought that, so books are antiques, right? There's no, there's no thing of books, but are magazines yeah. not an antique? Because he has, you know, magazine posters cut out of, of women all over the wall. Well, the, the idea there was he printed those out. So you would have, you would have, you would have like electronic magazines. Uh -huh. And we have, we, we, in the, in that version of the future, we have very, very, very good sort of material printers, 3D printers but, and but, but all he, that stuff. But, but we're 2339 or whatever year it is. Can't we have something better than posters on the wall? Like, what if, you know that, like, uh, in Star Wars, help me, only one, I'm your only hope. Like, what if you could have images like that of all those posters, you know, like around your room? Why can't we have something like that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I, it kind of made me because sad. I was like, I was like, wait a minute. You know, being a teenage boy, you still have to have the same posters on the wall. You can't have like some kind of new, uh, inventive tech. You know, spanking because, technology. Because 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 not every scene should be a scene about. Hey, look, we're a sci-fi show. Sometimes, okay. sometimes, even if it, if I mean, it, you know this. The what everything is about is setting a mood or setting a a tone, right? Yeah. And what you're trying to do with Diogo's surroundings there is you're trying to set the tone or the mood of this is an idiot teenage boy. He's doing all the shit idiot teenage boys do. And the shorthand for that is he's got pictures of girls on the wall. His, his room is a mess. Like that's a shorthand. And, and, and you don't think about it. You just see it and you go, oh, idiot teenage boy. He's got naked girls on the wall and he's got, you know, shit on the floor, right? Yeah. If you do like there's holographic dancing women all around it, what you're doing is you're saying, don't pay attention to the content of the scene. Don't pay attention to what Diogo is talking about with Miller. Pay attention to this flashy technology we've got. Pay attention. Look, we're a sci-fi show, right? And I think a lot of sci-fi shows fall into that trap. Everything has to be so sci-fi in every scene and so and so like eye-catchingly sci-fi that you never that that no scene ever just is the scene. You're spending so much time absorbing all the shit. Uh, it's, it's, it's my big problem with a lot of current sci-fi shows. But, but here's the thing. If you watch Harry Potter and you see the portraits and, and the, 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 the people in the portraits are like moving around in the porch or whatever, you don't, it doesn't take you away from the Harry Potter story. It adds to the atmosphere of like, oh, that's cool for a minute and then you move on. So all I'm saying is if there was, if they could move around like Harry, if they had Harry Potter women like ghost women in the or or whatever whoever's into in the the frame and they could move around and pose and you'd be like that's really cool and then you go back to the story but now you have this atmosphere of the future that's that's really i don't think any important dialogue scenes in harry potter take place in front of a moving portrait well you no know, you're wrong about you just that. move They're past them you just no, walk you, past that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. You move past So you see it at first, and then you're like, oh, wow, that's interesting. That's cool. And then you go back to the story. 
Because the first part but, of the story, but if the story uh, is take, but if the story is, if the dialogue's happening in front of that thing, you're just going to be looking at that thing. Yeah, but to say, look, there was the room was wallpapered with these posters. It wasn't like one or yeah. two posters. It was, it was already distracting. Right, so if you're gonna have it distracting, you might as well put a little bit of futuristic touch on it to be like, "Oh, that's clever." Like boys are still perverts, but at least their technology is at a higher level. And then you're like, "Oh, that's clever." Then you jump into the scene, and everything. <laughs> in that in that scene, I do not want people looking at the walls behind Diogo and thinking how clever it is. <laughs> hey, now, well, but 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 then you're looking at him saying, "Wait a minute, do they have magazines?" And then Jesus Christ, could they have like some wall showing, or is it all posters? <laughs> like, we get the point. He's like, we, okay. he's a teenager. So yeah. I have t- I have talked to, I have talked to many people about the show. You're the first person to bring that up. <laughs> so I don't think it was distracting for everybody else. I think it was just you. <laughs> okay, but uh, when we go further, can you and I invent the 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 Harry Potter Princess Leia image type thing in the frame where it's moving and then they probably already have that. So uh moving on. So <laughs> <laughs> Diogo is listening to some uh sick beats coming out of the out of the, the radio and you know Miller's Miller is asking him where this this music's coming from and uh explain to me because I, I kinda understand a little bit what Diogo is saying about there's a DJ that's putting this music off, but is there a DJ that's creating sound waves that are coming off of Eros and putting them into beats? Or was the DJ on Eros? What's happening is Eros is continuing to broadcast radio, right? Like all the right. stations are radio broadcasters broadcasting to the rest of the solar system. That's how they communicate. So there's still radio uh, transmitters on Eros that are broadcasting. What they're broadcasting is this weird gibberish that is a mix of like human voices and electronic sounds and, and all this stuff. And it is, the idea is that it is the, the sort of radio output from what's happening on Eros from the proto molecule beginning to absorb the technology and beginning to absorb the people and, and whatever it's doing there. And it's just eerie. It's this weird, creepy thing. It's, yeah. um, like it's you know what it is it's like if, if there was a ghost ship on the ocean and you pulled up alongside and you know the ship was broadcasting radio and when you listen to it it was like haunting sounds of the ship creaking and voices and that kind of stuff that's what it is right yeah i i dig it since it's just going out it to everywhere on the radio some dj on series or on taiko i mean um has taken those sounds and mixed them into a song, mix them into a beat. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and pe- people do that shit now. So it, it felt very, felt like a thing somebody would do. What people take voices of dead people, <laughs> put them in the songs. No, but, but people will take, um, I'm kidding. Things that are not music and mix uh-huh. them into musical tracks. Yeah, yeah, sure. They've been doing that forever. Um, but wouldn't yeah. it be interesting if they could cr- collect voices from dead, from the dead and create music out of it? <laughs> like, would you listen to that? If I was like Ty, I went to Gettysburg and recorded, and you know, I have a machine that could capture sound waves from back in time. Like it's, you know, it, it sound waves have a different time traveling uh, physics than than the rest of things. And so I have all these voices, and I made a mixtape with it with all these screams and cannon shots and everything. Would you listen to it, or would you morally be against it, or would you be curious? Would you be like, I want to hear? Let me- you could you could do that now. We have audio recordings of World War One. I. I mean, you could you could take audio recordings of World War One people in battles and stuff, and and mix it if you wanted. Those people are all dead. So are you? Are we? Did we just start a music group right now? I think we, we did. This, I think <laughs> I love it. I love it. Voices <laughs> is from the dead. Um. So you know, Miller's in Diego's room. He realizes that. That is a broadcast that's blasting out of Eros. Uh, and then he has a Julie vision. Now, my question to you is that, is this, is the vision of Julie similar to the vision that Miller has, that Holden has of Miller? Like, is it because the protomolecule sound waves are in the room, they're able to create the illusion of Julie that, that Miller can see? Or is this his own psychosis? We leave it ambiguous. Mm-hmm. Is, is this Miller just imagining julie or is Mm -hmm. there some 
some connection. Uh, you know, we, we can talk about this more when we get to, to episode five of this season, sort of the, the weird time paradox kind of effect that uh, the proto molecule is going to have. Okay. Uh, but yeah, th- it, at this point, it's, at this point, it's pretty ambiguous. Is it her? Is it him imagining her? Is, you know, it's to, sh- it's, it's to show the, uh, the ongoing obsession more than anything else. Okay. Now Miller goes to the Nabu, and you think for a second there because nobody likes him. He's been, uh, you know, kicked off of Eros, and he needs to find a way out. He has no money. He has no place to stay. He's got to live in uh, a, a, a dorm room from the 90s that has posters that are extinct, that they don't have posters in, but he still has them. They could have had Harry Potter illusions or star. But anyway, we're not going to go with that. So, um, <laughs> so now he is going to Naboo, and the story is at a point where you're like, oh my God, Miller is so desperate that's looking for something. Maybe he, maybe there's something about what these Mormons are saying that resonate with him. Maybe he's looking for a place to belong. Maybe that there's a possibility that this could be uh, something for him. But you come to learn that he's just doing reconnaissance, that he uh, knows that Eros is building towards something, that it's going to be a problem. And they got to take it out. And the Navu is really the only tool that he feels is big enough and powerful enough to do that. Um, and he goes to Fred Johnson and he brings his plan to Fred Johnson. And that's when he gives his bullshit excuse about uh, killing Dresden because, you know, he, 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 cause Dresden was making sense. I'm just kidding. It's not bullshit. But, you know, he, he, you know, he, he changed it. He should have said that earlier. But can we talk about what a solid dude Fred Johnson is for a second? And I'm learning this more as I go back and, and watch this because, you know, he got slapped with the rap of uh, Butcher of Anderson Station. Uh, he got tricked into killing people that he didn't want to kill. Uh, he didn't try to, like, whine or profess his innocence. He just left and went to help the group that he victimized, that he hurt. And so, and now he's there and nobody trusts him. He, he, you know, he's got, he's got, uh, I don't, a black flag, I think, got black flag people trying to, you know, uh, undermine him. He's got to throw his ass in the airlock and he's got a lot of shit going on. And then, uh, he, he's allows Holden to stay at Tycho station. He's allowing Miller to be there. Avasarala reaches out. Uh, she needs help with what she explains to him. She commits treason. She explains to him what the situation is and, and the, the trouble that she's in. She needs more data. She needs help. And, and uh, Fred is thinking about helping her. And Drummer says to Fred, if you do that, you know, for sure they're going to kill you. They're going to try to kill you. And he said, well, we're going to have to keep it a secret then. So he's risking his life for that. Now he has the one thing they got going, the big job on Tycho, the, the money train is the Navu. Now he's thinking about sacrificing this to go along with Miller's plan. I mean, he, he's a, He's he's a solid guy. He's a solid dude. Yeah, uh, he's one of the things that we what, that we always like to do is is create. Did you ever see a movie called um, The Lookout? It was a Joseph Gordon Levitt movie. What happens in it? Um, a guy who has a traumatic brain injury, who, played by Joseph Gordon Levitt, uh, who works as the janitor at a bank, gets tricked into helping. Some people rob that bank. No, I haven't seen it. Good movie. Oh, it's a fantastic movie. It's it's yeah. one of my favorite movies of that year. It's a small movie, but it's I I think Joseph Gordon Levitt's a great actor. Um, the 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 character is really interesting. It's this guy who was like the really popular guy in high school, but yeah, he, uh, he and his friends are out partying one night and they get a terrible car accident, and most of his friends are killed in that car accident, mm-hmm. and he gets a really terrible brain injury. Right. That causes him to forget things and have, a, have trouble uh, doing things, right? Right, right. And, um, and then he gets, he get, these new guys show up and they treat him like he's cool and they want to hang out with him. So he gets sucked into their thing and really they're just going to use him to rob this bank. Um, it's, it's a real, I, I, you should definitely check it out. I think it's a, it's a very, very good movie. But one of the yeah. things, so Daniel and I saw that movie um, when it first came out and we had a lot of conversations about it. One of the things we loved about it was how every single character in the lookout is given at least one trait that seems to run counter to our assumptions about them as a person. Now, did that, you and Dan uh, watch it together? Yeah, we, we went to the theater when it came out. Okay. Yeah. The, the two of us went and saw it at the theater when it came out. And, we, and 
we, well, that's one of the things we always talk about is how how it makes characters so much more interesting if they have at least one thing that seems to be the opposite of who they are. We like that sort of that that dichotomy that that opposites existing in the same person. So Fred Johnson is a guy who is he's a killer. You know, he was he was a Marine colonel. He was tasked with putting down insurrections in the belt when when he needed to be. He could be quite ruthless. So, you know, I mean, they, they tricked him. They didn't tell him that the belters on the station were surrendering. But the decision to pull the trigger and take that station out was still his decision. He still mm. pulled the trigger that killed all those people. You see him, you know, when he's having the conversation with the Black Sky guy in episode two. He, mm-hmm. that, guy, that guy looks like he's going to be trouble. Fred just bashes his head against the wall and chucks him out an airlock. Mm-hmm. Fred's a killer, right? Mm-hmm. But then we see him on the station and how he deals with people, other people. And he's generous. Mm-hmm. He's kind. Mm-hmm. He's, uh, he's very honest. He's, I would say he's almost unscrupul- like unflinchingly honest. Yes. What, um, before you move on, I just want to make a comment yeah. about the honesty. What's so, what makes Fred Johnson so mysterious is that one of the great traits about him is that he is honest. And so yeah. the whole time you're like, what is this motherfucker up to? I know he's, a, because we are so used to pure honesty, right? And then there's the characters yeah. like we expected from Holden. But to have somebody like him who's just purely honest, you automatically don't trust him. So you guys create right. this great mystery of, of him telling the truth. I'm sorry, go, go He's got to be up to something. No, yeah, no, I, I, no, that's, a, that's 100% right. What you just said is, was, that's the intention, is right. you create a character who is unfailingly honest, and right. the audience is so trained to expect betrayal right. that we're just the whole time we're going, oh, he's, he's up to something, he's going to do something. But, but having those two things, having those two sets of, of personality traits exist in the same characters is something I really like to do. I like, I like that Fred is honest and kind and, mm-hmm. and trustworthy and mm-hmm. generous and all that mm-hmm. and at the same time a cold-blooded killer mm-hmm. who yeah he felt bad after he killed all those belters but he still killed them mm-hmm. um you know he he didn't feel bad when he checked that black sky guy out the airlock he just did it right i mean mm-hmm. those two things existing in the same person i mean it's it's similar to you know amos who's i think an, an unflinching killer who's you know not in touch with his emotional side not in touch with his conscience um mm-hmm. And at the same time, if he sees a child or, or a weak, innocent person being mistreated, he's like mm-hmm. a pit bull. He's a guard dog, right? Mm-hmm. Having those two things exist in the same character, I think, is, is really interesting to me. Uh, so, yeah, that, that was the idea with Fred, is to have him have these very contradictory personality traits. And watch The Lookout, because that's, that's the movie that got Daniel and I started talking about that that character building tool of always make sure every character has at least one really contradictory trait in their character building. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, and did you, how far in the advance, in the expanse were you when you watch, when you watched that movie, like did that influence any of the character work in the expanse? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It influenced things that ha- happened in the expanse. What year did that movie come out? I don't remember, but I, I think we were working on the expanse when it came out, but it just made us really, and I think we probably had done some of that sort of instinctively, but it really made yeah. us, the lookout gave us a tool to talk about that thing that we didn't have right. before that. I just had a thought, you know, I, I feel like throughout the podcast, we've uh, used a lot of uh, uh, n- naughty words, cuss words. What the I fuck are you talking about, sh- man? <laughs> I think we should have Clint and Joseph do a clean version so all your old friends in the cult can listen to it. And enjoy the, <laughs> and be a part of the of the Ty and that guy family. I think that'd be a good thing. Okay, so uh, Clint and Joseph, take note. That's what we're gonna do. Um, okay, now we're to uh, Alex. Alex storyline in this, and he can't get over the fact that he's made mistakes in the invasion, uh, and he got yeah. people killed, and it's really hitting him hard. And so he's running over the simulation over and over and over again, and. I mean, obviously, you know, the rest of the Rossi crew is like, they, they figured it out. They're, they're over that hill, and, and he's still struggling to come to grips with what happened, and, uh, and he's wrestling with it. Well, I mean, if you, think, if you think about who Alex is at this point in the story, um, he talks about the fact that, yeah, he was in the Navy, but he was a bus driver. He was a transport pilot. He was not a right. guy who flew into active war zones. Yeah. He, he yeah. probably, 
Alex probably never had a buddy get killed while, while he was in the service. Right. Right. He lost all his friends on the Canterbury and that hit him really hard. You know, the, the death of all his friends on the Canterbury is probably the first time he lost a bunch of friends like that. Mm -hmm. But this is the first time he lost fellow fighters in a fight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That has never happened to him before. You know, I mean, Holden was was a front line. He was he served on a destroyer. Holden served on a destroyer in the in the UNN. So he was he was a front line uh, naval officer. So he probably mm -hmm. has much more experience with that. Mm -hmm. Naomi was in the OPA. She has watched friends of, friends of hers die. Uh, Amos, of course, grew up in violence. Alex is the only one who is unaccustomed to this idea that when you go into battle, some of the people you go into battle with might not make it. And he's really struggling with that. That like and 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 I, I know that one of the things that happens when people have a traumatic experience where they feel like they could have done something differently is this tendency to replay the the thing over and over in your mind and try to find the way you could have fixed it. Even though it doesn't matter now. There's no way that you can go back in time and fix it. But I've watched people do that where like, Well, I should have done this. If I'd done this, I could have fixed the whole thing. It's like, yeah, but even if that's true, you'll never know. You can't go back in time and try that and see. But, but Alex is in that mental trap now. He's trying to figure out how he could have done it right, how he could have fixed it, how he could. He, he's trying to figure out a way that he can save 25 people who have already died in the past. And it's a, yeah, I mean, it's a tough spot. I just think that's a limited way of thinking because what if we figure out the whole time travel thing and then all the guys <laughs> who have done all the hard work to figure out how to do the thing that, the right way, they could go back and get it done, but you're going to be unprepared uh, and you're not going to know how to, to go back and fix anything. Yeah, I don't think we're ever going to invent time travel because if anyone has ever invented time travel, it's already been invented and we'd have time travelers hanging out. How do you know they're not? That's true. That's yeah, true. I, Maybe they're just really you know they're sneaky. Not? Well, look, yeah. I mean, it depends on what time travel path you subscribe to because if there's the, one, the, the circular one where you go back and you can affect the future, or if you go back and it creates another timeline, or the Ray Bradbury where you step on the trail and you, you smash a, a, a bug and then you come back and the whole world is completely different. So maybe they, uh, maybe that time travel, they have to be very, very careful when they come back because they don't want to affect anything, you know? I'm going to go outside, okay. I'm going to run around and stomp on a bunch of bugs just to fuck them up. <laughs> but but you're, <laughs> you could be on the main timeline and that's already there. That's not going to do anything. You have to go back and fuck things up. Because now that's already accounted for. Um, but in honor of our uh, ghost band, ghost voices band that we're going to create, I mean, that's going to be, I think that could be something, right? Like if you can get voices of dead people and then put it into beats, I think we're on to something, right? No? Okay. So in honor of that, <laughs> uh, I, th I, think, uh, I think we're going to talk about ghost movies. Do a, do a top five list of our most favorite uh, ghost movies of all time. And I kind of have a pool. You know what's, I love ghost movies. I love them. But what's interesting to me is that I didn't have a big list. You know, you, every other thing that we've done so far, like I can just sit down and just write a, a list, a pool of all these movies. But ghost movies are kind of interesting because it all, also a lot of ghost movies kind of move into that haunted house movie where it could be more of a haunted house movie than a, go, a ghost movie. And uh, so I didn't have like a large pool of like what I would consider ghost movies, but ghost movies done right are one of my favorite part of the horror spectrum. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you want to give me, you want me to give you the pool or do you want me to give you my list? And then you might want to bump. Just something. hit me with your list. I want to hear what you okay. got. Okay. All right, number one is The Shining. Uh, I think The Shining is a masterpiece. I, yep. uh, I, I've watched that movie over and over again. It's, it's fascinating to me. It's interesting to me. Love The Shining. And I also thought, actually, me and you, Ty, we went and saw Dr. Sleep in the theater. Uh, yep. And I thought that was just as rewarding uh, of an experience. I really enjoyed Dr. Sleep. Not a as rewarding i mean the i remember i remember when you and i i remember when you and i walked out of dr sleep we're walking down the street and it was in toronto because we yeah. were shooting we're walking mm -hmm. down the street in toronto and we were both just being quiet and then i i turned <laughs> to you and i said was that really good and you're like yeah i think that was really good <laughs> i mean with, i think we were both just kind of like I think I think we were surprised by how much I you could that I could not believe that he pulled it off. I mean, think about how complicated that 
to do the sequel to that movie is and all the moving parts that had to work. And yeah. The Shining is already a paradox to me because I adore, uh, I, I think it, the, the, actual, the Kubrick movie, I think it's a masterpiece. I'm fascinated by it. I watch it over and over and over. But I agree with all of Stephen King's uh, criticism of the movie. Well, not all, the main criticism. And if you go back and look at Stephen King's book, the arc of the, the Jack Nicholson character, I think is more defined. I think it's more interesting. And I think it, 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 uh, it, it, it has, has a completely different effect. And Jack Nicholson starts off the movie batshit crazy. And, you know, Kubrick has always been one, one of, I think there's no question that Kubrick's a genius. He's made some of my most favorite movies of all time. But one of the things that Kubrick, he is not a feeling director. He's cold. Yeah. He does it. He yeah. doesn't. He doesn't need you to like his characters. He didn't care if you liked Jack Nicholson uh, at first or not. And yeah. I, I, I just have a different sensibility. Like I, wa- I would like to watch The Shining and connect to this guy's struggle, you know, get to know him, and then watch him fall into madness, not start off in madness. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? I, 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 th- I think the, the problem there is when people – think that the shining is the movie version of the book because it's not yeah um they 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 have some similarities like yeah. they're in a similar location they have some similarities in plot but they're completely different stories i mean kubrick made his own thing um, yeah. as a novelist i see why that's frustrating you know if somebody yeah. had gotten the rights to the expanse and then using the name of my books went off and made some completely other thing that had nothing to do with my books. Yeah, that would be frustrating. I would find that annoying. Yeah. I totally get Stephen King's position there. Right. I understand why he's annoyed by that. But having said that, if that person went off and made a Kubrickian masterpiece <laughs> out of The Expanse, that yeah. that was completely different but still called The Expanse, I'm not going to be that upset. Like I'd, I'd be annoyed, but I'd be like, you know, but he did make a masterpiece. Well, I would, the reason I'm upset is I think it is a masterpiece, but I think story-wise, I think it could even have been a, a notch better if you would have had a different experience with the Jack Nicholson's character early in the movie uh, and what that came out to be. And what I, really do, I imp- don't think you have time. I don't think you have time at feature length to tell that story. I think, I think novels, are, d- novels don't make good movies because novels are about six episodes worth of content. I think they pulled off in Dr. Sleep because what the challenge of Dr. Sleep is, is you got a lot of people that know The Shining through Stephen King's book, and then you got the other half of people that know the yep. movie The Shining. And so you have this yep. completely different things that are living under the title The Shining. Now you have to unify them, put that in a story, and tell it that satisfies the movie fans of The Shining and the book fans of The Shining, or, or like me, the fans of both. And, uh, yeah. and, and, and it was genius. What was the director's name? Do you remember off the top of your head? I don't. I don't remember. I, I, thought it was, I thought it was an incredibly well done movie. I was really surprised by it. Um, I've seen it. I think I've seen it like three or four more times since you and I watched it. Uh, uh-huh. When it became available on streaming. I made, I made my wife watch it. Um, I've watched it a couple other times. It, that is not because I have a gigantic crush on Rose the Hat. <laughs> Rose the Hat, man. It's just so that is serious. not because of that. Um, but the reality is I have a gigantic crush on Rose the Hat. I, yeah. And you know, like, like I, I, would, I remember I remember when you and I talking about it afterwards. We're like, I'm like, if the if those people in the motorhome show up and Rose the Hat is like, hey, come be vampires with us, I'm gonna be like, Yeah, okay, cool. I'm going. I, dude, I'm going, I am Rose, such- me and you. Every time I watch those movies, like when you're a kid, you stay up late at night and you watch those old vampire movies, I'm all like, yeah. I, would be, I would be screwed. You know, like if you think about Dracula, what kind of reason you had those three uh, lady vampires. And, and Monica ones. Bellucci shows up. <laughs> I'm like, hey, look, <laughs> eternity in darkness, baby. Let's go. Like, I'm in there. <laughs> and then if, if Rose the Hat shows up and I'm like, okay, she's going to suck my soul out of, out of my mouth, but... Maybe this time it's different. Maybe she really likes me. <laughs> maybe she likes me. <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe I could change right? her. Maybe I could bring her back yeah. to the good side. 
You know, uh, well, yeah, now, she's she's sucking my soul out through my mouth, but that's kind <laughs> of like kissing. Yeah, and then I'd be like, all right, I'm just going to keep an eye on it and just make sure that I can stop it right before all of my soul is gone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and then number two on the list, Ghostbusters. Okay, I love Ghostbusters. I don't uh, consider it a ghost movie, but I, I I love that movie. It's it for me. It's one of the few perfect movies. The movie's called Ghost. Busters. How is that not a ghost it is. movie? <laughs> because the ghosts are never intended to be scary. The, the librarian had a little bit of scariness to her. A little bit, but, yeah. Oh, well, then that's interesting. So, like, what clarifies, you know, what, what clarifies a ghost movie? Is it a movie that has ghosts in it and it's about ghosts? Or does it have to be scary? Um, you know, like, how, what would you say is a ghost movie? I mean, by, by that definition... By your definition, Casper is a ghost movie. Um, it is a ghost it's movie. Like a it's goofy, a ghost. Yeah, it's a goofy comedy. Uh, but no, for me, uh, so all the movies on my list would all be horror movies. They would all be supernatural horror movies. Okay. But um, what about Beetlejuice? I, I, Beetlejuice is a yeah, straight see, that's, up. That's a ghost is. movie. It they, totally is. It's about the afterlife. It totally about is. Ghost movies. It would not be on my list. It would not be on my list. Now, if you ask me about like horror comedies or like ghost comedies or that kind of thing, then yeah, definitely. But And Ghostbusters, okay. it, like if, if you, the list Ghostbusters is on is top five comedies of all time. Ghostbusters yeah. is on that list for sure. Yeah, and, and I, was, I was thinking about that, like as I was writing it, it's like, what makes a ghost movie? I consider, I, can, I mean, it, because there are things that exist in multiple categories, you know, obviously. Uh, but... You, I, if you and I were in a court of law and I was arguing that Ghostbusters was a ghost movie and you arguing that it wasn't, I would win that, that, that battle. But I can understand what you're saying. I can understand because if you hear the term ghost movie, you're not thinking ghost uh, busters. You're thinking movies that are spooky and that scare you. So maybe you can I don't, I don't know if else. you would win that court battle just because I probably can afford better lawyers than you can. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean... I, I know, I know, Jen's doing okay, but I, I don't know if I, she's going to throw her I, money. I, I thought you were going to say uh, you can out argue me, which is a stronger case. But uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but affording lawyers is not. Uh, so uh, number three is Poltergeist. L- love me some yeah. Poltergeist. Love Poltergeist that. is great. Yeah, and uh, Spielberg. He, you know, he's got his hand. If you look at Spielberg's IMDb, if he didn't direct it. Or he somehow he's involved with every movie that meant something in the eighties. It's pretty impressive to me. Yeah. So I'm yeah. glad you agree with Spielberg. Now number four on my list, uh, I'm interested to to hear your opinion on it and what you thought of it. And the reason that it's on my list is because a lot of times, if you see a movie in the theater and you're in the right headspace and you're in the right age, the right headspace, you're open for it, you don't know anything about it, and it hits you in the right way, then no matter what you criticism or anything you hear about the movie past it, you still remember that experience, and that's why it's on my list. So my number four is The Sixth Sense, because I adored that movie. I had such a great experience when I first watched it. I remember going to see it in theater. I had no idea about anything, and that's my favorite way to watch a movie. Like I, I didn't see the trailer. I didn't see anything like that. I was like... Uh, it's a ahead. great movie. Yeah. It's oh, I just great movie. I'm agreeing with you. It's a great movie. Yeah. Now, number yeah. five, I love uh, this movie. Uh, it's The Others with Nicole Kidman. Um, did you see that? I did. Yeah, it's, it's all right. I, I didn't uh, love it. Uh, oh, you didn't love it? Why not? There are so many other movies in that same space that I think okay. are better. All right, so I'm going to yeah. give you my pull. And, by the, and also, too, like when I saw The Others, it was just a, it's such a great watching experience so i'm going to give you my pool and it's a shallow pool and i'm sure you got some ones that i'm missing and i'm not thinking of and and well uh, I, sure the thing i'm noticing is you're not including any of the classics there are some classic ghost stories that i think uh aren't, aren't making your list that i would put on that list but go ahead yeah hit me with the pool I'm pro- and i'm probably going to be embarrassed when you bring when you bring go ahead, hit me with the pool. That I think about. and you know i'm sure the fans are going to correct us the changeling uh, that's what that that would be in my top five. I yeah, was surprised the changeling wasn't on your list. Yeah, the changeling. I think be the changeling may be maybe one of the best ghost stories ever made. George you know C. I Scott. Think, I mean, it's it's brilliant. You know what? I I could actually bump 
the others or the six cents for the changeling because now I think the reason I uh, changed the, the reason changeling was on the list is because I haven't seen it in so long. But when I sit and think about it, like I remember the ball, the bouncing ball. I remember the boys' little feet on the sidewalk. George C. Scott. It's so creepy. It's, it's so creepy. So I just creepy. rewatched it. I just rewatched it about four months ago. Uh huh. It it because it's on Shutter now. I I have a streaming service called Shutter. It, it when the Changeling came on Shutter, I was like, oh, I need to check that out again because I had seen it a long time ago. I rewatched it. Oh my god, does it hold up? It's so creepy. Really, it's so actually, unsettling. I might, I might yeah. watch it tonight. I loved it growing up. Now, was it? it doesn't yeah. it connect to like a senator or something to do with politics? Like the it was the old senator's yeah. house or something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um. Yeah. It has like kind of a great story. Now there are. Four movies on my list that I've always wanted to see that I haven't seen yet. And, I'm, and I, was, okay. I wrote them down because I wanted to ask you if you've seen them. Uh, the first one okay. is We Are Still Here. Have you seen that? I have seen that. How is it? It's all right. We're talking about. It's not worth talking about. Yeah, uh, the, uh, it's all right. Do you remember the old uh, movie, The Beyond? The Beyond. It was, the Beyond? Uh, yeah. It's The Beyond. And it's like this girl that has these white eyes. She's like a ghost and she's... Because I remember that yeah. as a kid, and I remember, like, bits and pieces yeah. of it, and I remember it being, like, really spooky, but I can't remember so much. Uh, did you ever see the movie called A Ghost Story with uh, Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara? I have not. And then, no, I, I'm, not, I'm, not as, I'm not as obsessed with Casey Affleck as you are. <laughs> yeah, I have my, I have my uh, Harry Potter uh, Princess Leia hologram of him in my room. Um, <laughs> Lake Mungo. Have you seen Lake Mungo? I, I love Lake Mungo. I think Lake Mungo is fucking brilliant. Really? It is brilliant. Lake Mungo, Lake Mungo has the most unsettling end credits I have ever watched in my life. Okay. So tell me about Lake Mungo without giving away spoilers because it, I, I've always been interested in it, but it's, it, it's hard to read about it. I'm not going to tell you anything about it. So just, just. Take two hours and watch it, seriously, or an hour and a half or whatever it is. I'm not, okay. so I, I, here, let me, let me tell you. Um, I watched that movie because I watch every horror movie. I watched that movie and I was like, holy shit, this thing was brilliant. I called Daniel and I go, dude, uh, Lake Mungo, it's on, I think it was on Amazon or whatever. I said, it's on whatever. Go watch it right now. And he's like, all right, well, the kid's going to bed in a few minutes. I'll, I'll watch it. He goes, what's it about? I said, I'm not telling you, just watch it. The next day he calls me and he goes, oh my God, I'm so glad you made me do that. I'm, and he goes, I'm so glad you didn't tell me anything. Okay, it's, don't it's tell me anything. Just got, don't tell me anything. Just got to watch. Just got to okay. experience it. I, I don't tell me anything. But you're a fan. I love that movie. I thought it was brilliant. It's, it's slow. Okay. It's a slow burn. But the yeah. payoff is so huge. And, but you know, like every, yeah. anytime you've ever recommended me something to me, book, movie, everything, it's been on point. So I'm on it. Yeah. All right, what did I miss? Definitely check that one out. Um, you missed the classic Ghost Story. I don't know that movie. Oh, my God. Uh, okay, so he, he put this on your list to watch Ghost Story. Um, it's from the 80s, from the early 80s. Um, uh, shit, what is her name? Uh, the actress who plays the Borg Queen. Um, Alice Krieg. Alice Krieg. That's what I was trying to think of. Okay, mm -hmm. so the actress Alice Craig, I, I'm sure you've seen her in a million things. She, was, she so, plays the Borg Queen in Star Trek. The wife um, of Apollo Creek? <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. that one. What, what um, was she in Star Trek? Oh, by the way, I watched uh, Wrath of Khan, finally. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that because okay, we've got to talk sorry, about Wrath sorry. of Khan. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so it's, it's, a, it's an early 80s uh, movie about these, these four old guys uh, played by four amazing actors. Uh, older older gentlemen in their 70s who get together on Sundays and have drinks and tell each other ghost stories. And a ghost starts showing up to them one by one and killing them. And then one of the guys, his son, tries to figure out what's going on, what secret these four guys share before his father gets killed, and unravels this past that these four guys share, this dark past that they have. That's leading to this ghost showing up. And it's creepy as fuck. This movie is creepy as fuck. It's got legitimate scares. Alice Krieg is radiant in it. 
it's it's the performances are amazing by the the four old dudes are played by like these four amazing old actors it's it, that seriously you will thank me for having turned you on to that movie what should i watch first ghost story or lake uh do it pick a day when you got a bunch of time and do a double feature great double okay. feature all right um all right so you finally watched wrath of khan which ties in because wrath of khan is people dealing with the ghosts of their past oh <laughs> i see what you did there i see what yeah you did thank you so one thing that i felt like hurt the movie was like the nordic looking uh staying alive barbarians from <laughs> from the from that uh planet in the beginning that that they were uh exiled to like they like the rod stewart hair guy uh con and dude it was the early 80s it was I the know. early 80s man i know bro have but it's a like, little context it, here dude listen there is nobody that loves 80 cheese more than me okay like i am a staying alive John Volta fan when he does his big barbarian kick with his barbarian boots at the end and the totally Sylvester Stallone directed staying alive like I'm on board I don't know why I don't know if I've turned into a snob I don't know but like that was the one thing that kind of took me out is that these like Nordic looking like barbarian like fake bar it wasn't even like uh, Ricardo, Ricardo Montalban isn't Nordic he's fucking Spanish no 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 the crew his crew his crew, they're oh, all okay. like, 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 uh, bright blonde, like platinum blonde hair with like crystal clear blue eyes, and like, and they were dressed like, uh, you know, it's like you go watch Beastmaster. That's how a barbari barbarian looks, right? They didn't anyway. So that 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 kind of I was like, what's going on there? But the movie itself, I really enjoyed, and I enjoyed way more than I thought I was going to because. Uh, I've never seen, this was my first experience with Star Trek. The only experience I've ever had with Star Trek before was I remember like as a kid, I saw like the ending of like they were bringing wells to, uh, to the ocean or something. And, uh, and I just saw like, a, I didn't know if it was a movie or the show. I just saw like a glimpse of it, right? So yeah. I watched Ride the Con and I really enjoyed it. And one of the things is I really liked the, the humor and the chemistry of the crew and him and Spock yeah. and, and the other guy. And like, uh, and I thought Spock was a way more, in, uh, not uh, uh, Captain uh, uh, Kirk was a way more interesting and layered kind of character than, than I thought that he was. And the whole cat and mouse with Khan and, yeah. and, 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 and Khan not being able to let go of his vengeance and it bringing him into madness and Khan, you know, in the beginning, you're like, well, Khan's a smart motherfucker. He's going to be outmatched. But like, uh, but, but Kirk and, and uh, Spock are scrappy. You know, they're scrappy yeah. little, and they have they're this scrappy. little bit of, they're scrappy and they have this little bit of mischief to them, you know, that, uh, that I think is really interesting, especially at the end where they're in the, the Garden of Eden cave. And you think that they've been, you know, marooned on this planet, uh, but they knew all along, and they were they were listening in on the conversation. They knew that that Khan was listening. That was a great turn, and it worked really well on me because I didn't know, you know, I didn't I didn't know really the personalities and everything yet. And then Spock taking one for the team and dying, and uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a, it's a fun cat and mouse, really, you know. And what I realized too, what I really liked about Star Trek, which I which I tend to like about a lot of uh, sci-fi movies. I like the atmosphere. Like I like the day-to-day -day yeah. spaceship, you know, doing things. And I, I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Well, okay. Now you, now you have seen the best Star Trek ever. So you can just right. stop. Like you started yeah. with everything you see, any Star Trek you see from now on will be, you let down. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to, I, I won't watch anymore because if that, that's the best one, I, you know, I wouldn't want to watch anything. You, you've, you've already, you've already, you peaked, you peaked at the beginning. Yep. Now, did Leonard Nimoy, did he become a director? He did. Yeah. He's actually, he was actually quite a, quite a good director. Um, Cause I remember. Yeah. I, I read somewhere like in x-ray as I was watching it, the Amazon x-ray thing, there was like, so, he directed something. And I was like, what? Like it was a great movie. And then it, it moved on and I, I didn't go back and look, but apparently he's directed some really great stuff. Yeah, he actually became quite a quite an accomplished director. Um, Nimoy directed Three Men and a Baby. Like, how crazy and random is that? And he directed a couple of Star Trek movies, some good ones actually. 
Uh-huh. Um, not nothing as good as as Wrath of Khan, but you know he directed some decent Star Trek movies. Uh, Shatner tried to direct a Star Trek movie, and it is generally considered to be the worst Star Trek movie of all time. So yeah, Which Shatner's directing Star Trek Five: Quest for God. Oh, is that where they go and talk to God on a planet? Yeah. Oh. And then and then and then Spock shows up and kills God with a laser. <laughs> <laughs> ha- have you seen? Uh, did you watch T.J. Hooker growing up? I did. Yeah. Heather Locklear. This is three fifty seven Magnum. It'll leave a one inch hole going in and a six inch hole coming out. I actually went on YouTube and like pulled up a little bit of T.J. Hooker because I was like, man, I haven't seen Shat because I don't. I know uh, William Shatner as T.J. Hooker. I don't know him yeah. as Captain Herc. So like my experience with him is T.J. I'm like, oh yeah, I used to love that show, you know. And well, I mean, I think it had a lot to do with Heather Locklear. But uh, yeah. oh, that's right, Heather Locklear. That was her. That was her first big star turn, right? Yeah, that was her first big one, and then uh, before Melrose Place. <laughs> All right. Well, that. Do you have anything else you want to talk about, Ty? Before we uh, bring this to a close. No, but I'm. I'm glad I got to tell you about uh, Ghost Story because uh, I'm surprised you haven't seen that. You. You love '80s horror. I can't believe I didn't see Ghost Story. I'll be. I'll be. I'll be. I'll text okay. you tomorrow. So, but... so Lake Mungo is slow. It, it. It's in a documentary style. It's like they're shooting mm-hmm. a documentary about this this tragedy. So it's slow. It's in a documentary style. It has a wonderful payoff, but it's slower. Ghost Story is a much more straight-ahead horror movie like you would expect. Mm -hmm. So depend on your mood. Are you in the mood for something a little slower? Watch Lake Mungo. If you're in the mood for like straight-ahead horror, watch Ghost Story. All right, well, thank you guys for coming to hang out with uh, Midnight and Ty Stick. We had a good time. Uh, We discussed Season 2, Episode 3, Static, and... uh, Talked about all these wonderful things. Uh, please let us know what you think. Like and subscribe. If I left out ghost movies and you're pissed off at me, list them in the in the wherever message board, and then and I'll t- I'll I'll bring them back up. Yeah, and guys, I I know that Wes left out the hunting. I was going to mention the haunting. I forgot about it, but uh, yeah. But is it? Should have put the haunting that, on there. But isn't that a haunted house movie? Uh, I guess. I mean, yeah, aren't and, all haunted and, house movies ghost stories? Well, but see, a haunted house movie is a specific thing that you would that we would have to say, "Hey, we're doing haunted house movies." And so, Poltergeist some, isn't a haunted house story. No, I was about to say there's some crossover. So, like the Changeling, you could say is a haunted house movie, but I see that yeah. it's a little bit more of a ghost story. And Poltergeist, I think, is a little bit more of a ghost story because it's more. It's not so much about the house; it's about what's under the house. It's about what was buried underneath <laughs> that town. You know, <laughs> yeah, you always have an interesting taxonomy. <laughs> uh, say bye, Ty. Bye, Ty.